A lot of judo people are going to read the title of this video and immediately, rightfully, call BS. Kazush is far from a lost concept. Most judo schools today probably talk about it in every class to some capacity. What I'm referring to in that title is that the way we think about Kazush has changed. I'll explain what I mean, but for the confused BJJ person in the back who thinks all Japanese terminology is gibberish, even though crap like borrowed a plata and random tech named after people is just as uninformative, let me talk about what Kazush actually is. The reason so many people use the Japanese for this term rather than a translation is that it actually translates pretty poorly. What most people will describe it as is the act of unbalancing an opponent to set up a takedown. Where I train, alternatively, it's typically referred to as the point where an opponent can no longer recover his balance. Those two definitions sound about the same, but actually the first one implies that Kazush is an ingredient to a good throw, whereas the second one implies that the Kazush is basically the throw itself. If I were going to give my own explanation, it would be something like this. Kazush is the use of movement, body position, and or body mechanics to damage or destroy an opponent's balance in the service of throwing the opponent or increasing the odds of a successful throw. Very precise language, but also kind of word soup. So we use the received shorthand, Kazush. The concept of Kazush is older than Judo, appearing in older schools under different names, but the founder of Judo, Jigoro Kano, really was the first to put it front and center. His basic thesis was that the balance of a person can be broken in eight directions. Often diagrams like the one on screen would be devised to help envision this, and to this day many, many mats are covered in tape that serves as a similar visual guide. Later, Tokyo Hirano also added directions of up and down to this theoretical framework, which is why I assume so much of his film has him jumping up and down like a goober, but don't be fooled, the guy was a legitimate competitor and a legend in his own time. A lot of more visual viewers misunderstand the point of demonstrations is to, well, demonstrate often, as is the case here, with an emphasis on a particular concept. In this case, he's jumping up and down because he wants to show Kuzush in an up and down axis. But if you're not a believer in the idea of unbalancing someone vertically, consider snap downs and all the setup potential that they have. In essence, that is what this is. In short, the original premise of Kazush was mostly two-dimensional in eight directions along a horizontal plane. Aokyu argued that no, unbalancing can in fact happen vertically, and that we need to start considering Kazush in 3D. Neat little technical and historical lesson, but it doesn't really seem like anything was lost here. Let me address that now. In modern gyms and dojos, your teacher probably demonstrates a technique and explains where the kazush needs to happen in order to make a throw successful. Hidden in plain sight, therein lies the major change in thinking. Nowadays, kazush is thought of as a part of a good throw. But in reading older texts and ideas, especially in the native Japanese, it's clear that wasn't always the case. Originally, throws were a means to study kuzush. In other words, the process and the outcome have changed places. A strong understanding of kuzush was once an essential goal when practicing throws, but now kuzush is an essential component to completing throws. The older way of thinking is basically what defined what is colloquially known as classical judo, and the new way is part and parcel to modern judo. So what changed and why should you care? From where I sit, there are two major reasons why this shift happened. The first reason is a person, Anton Giesink. A legendary judoka in his own right, Giesink was the first non-Japanese judoka to really run shop on the Japanese, having won gold at the 1964 Olympics. Although it would be a slow change, what the Japanese eventually learned from their encounter with him and with other Europeans was that they really needed to weight train. 
Prior to this, and even in some traditional Japanese martial arts today, like sumo, lifting weights was more or less a taboo. Even Jigoro Kano himself thought it to be an inefficient use of energy and deplored large, hard muscles. Now, you may be thinking that this is the story of how modern weight training overtook the traditional methods of training. A lot of people, especially Westerners, are weak to narratives that celebrate supposed progress, especially when that progress means something foreign is dethroned by something familiar. This isn't the story of how weightlifting is better than Kazush, nor is it the story of how Kazush is secretly better than weightlifting. The reality is that both things are valuable, and both have qualities that the other lacks. They are useful for different people at different times, and, of course, as we know from modern competition, are indeed still useful when combined. Weightlifting, for example, is something that can impact a person's game at, frankly, a miraculous speed. It is not impossible to take a junior competitor and, with professional guidance, give them an Olympic Games tier strength in as short as four years. This speed is what really has given weight training an edge in the competition-driven martial arts world. Although the highest level athletes definitely have a good understanding of Kazus 2, their strength training can often allow them to force throws to happen. On a surface level, weightlifting is also really, really easy to understand. Pick up progressively heavier things, put them back down, profit. There are drawbacks though. Weightlifting can be the source of a lot of bodily stress. It also typically decreases your flexibility if you're not stretching regularly, and I know a lot of weightlifters who don't, and has diminishing returns as you age. While some weightlifting is always good, there are also variables in the mix that mean that certain people are just going to benefit more from the time in the gym than others. On the other side of the spectrum is classical kazoo's training, which mostly involves a conscious effort to understand the most efficient ways to unbalance a person through various throws. At its core, this is about building up a type of new sensitivity. Kazush, on a physiological level, is just more complex to master than weightlifting. It requires building new neural pathways to instinctively understand minute movements in an opponent in real time, plus having the minimum physical prowess to act on that data instantaneously. It is hard to understate just how challenging this process is. Kuzush on paper seems pretty straightforward. Unbalance a person in a direction and execute throw. But it starts to get wildly abstract when we start to add variables. Is your partner taller? Shorter? Stronger? Weaker? Faster? Slower? Defensive? Aggressive? Wide? Thin? Flexible? Stiff? And so on. For every combination of unique variables, the kuzush will be different. So it isn't a matter of reciting memorized definitions or even memorized throws, but the subtle ability to intuitively understand the balance of any given opponent in real time. The benefits of training with a focus on Kuzush are that it typically allows you to train harder much longer into life. You maintain more flexibility, and it complements competitors who prefer to use agility and large movement rather than muscle. Like weightlifting, though, there are definitely palpable drawbacks. This kind of training takes a very, very grueling long time, often years. Because it doesn't promise quick results, it also means it's easy to become discouraged in it as a path to success. It's even easy to disregard it as just not working, period, if you're not seeing progress fast enough. I mentioned two reasons why it fell out of style, though. If the first was the rise in weightlifting, the second is market forces. Even though I've lived and trained in Asia, I'm going to come at this point from an American perspective specifically. People here in the States are extremely, painfully obsessed with outcomes. The average consumer doesn't just want to be good at a skill they're picking up. They want to be good at it right now. It is beyond difficult to tell a 20-something kid who wants to compete to slow down and just trust the process. In fact, saying trust the process in an American context 
may even get your facility labeled as a cult depending on who you say it to. The U.S. martial arts hobbyists, especially the young ones, don't want to wait, nor do they have any trust in any kind of long game program. If you're teaching them takedowns, they want to be able to take someone down of similar skill level in not years or months, but in weeks, preferably days. The most proven way to succeed in the martial arts market is to teach in a way that produces results as fast as possible. Even better if it's coming from a competitor with a record. Now there is absolutely some virtue in this. I am not arguing that consumers need to just shut up and be patient. People need to see progress, especially when they are handing over hard-earned cash. On the flip side, though, it would be irresponsible not to notice how this impacts the dialogue in martial arts culture. In recent years, for example, I have seen an increase in support for the position that a single leg takedown is the quote-unquote best takedown, and that things like drop soenage rarely work, expose your back, etc., etc. But if we back up here for a second, is it that a single leg is the supposed best takedown, or just that it's really, really simple and the first one most people learn in the U.S.? Simplicity isn't a bad thing either, but the breaking of balance in a single leg is really fundamentally easy to understand. You lift the person's leg, then move to topple them. Because this is such a simple concept, it is really easy to get this throw operational very quickly. Then, once someone experiences success with it, they are much more likely to invest in it more heavily, rather than spend time developing throws that have more subtle kazoosh, throws like drop seoi. In reality, I have never seen a truly great drop seoi specialist have their back taken. The forward momentum is just too great. Likewise, I have been on the receiving end of a few, and I can guarantee that if I didn't just accept the throw, I probably would have popped a knee or something. The single leg is an awesome takedown, no doubt. And there are definitely levels to it, too. I am absolutely not arguing that a D1 wrestler is a chump just because they use a weak one technique. Obviously not. Those guys are awesome and their single legs are top tier. The point I am trying to make is that martial arts hobbyists are often blinded by early successes to the detriment of long-term development. Having a profound understanding of Kuzush is reliant on a long-term outlook. In short, the casual martial artist of today is more interested in highlight reels and feeling as if they can hit new things faster rather than any training method that requires delayed gratification. Weightlifting and strong financial incentive to teach things with quick return on investment is really what killed Kazush as a pillar training goal. Again, I want to stress that most high-level judo athletes tend to have pretty good kuzush. It's just not the centerpiece of their training. And where it is most visible is in their narrow catalog of specialty techniques. Will this kind of training just be resigned to history then? Probably not but I suspect it is never going to be a super viable marketing strategy. Even if someone came out of the woodwork and described a really effective training method, if it takes too long or requires exceptional effort, most people will probably not be swayed. The martial arts need hobbyists because that is what keeps them alive. Yet at the same time, hobbyists are often paradoxical bundles of hypocritical ideas. They want to do a martial art yet they want it to be perfectly safe. They want to be great at it, but also not have to devote too much time. They want to get better at takedowns, but won't learn how to safely fall. All of this and hobbyists typically aren't the ones pushing martial arts forward either. Rather, they are often the decentralized force of orthodoxy. It is the martial arts hobbyist that is in the comments saying, that would never work, when in reality, what they mean is, that hasn't worked for me. It's a culture that turns people off from trying new, or old, unexplored things because they are inefficient, too dangerous, or too time-intensive. All drawbacks that might be overcome and innovated on 
if people actually did put the mat time in on these more obscure corners of the craft. This isn't to rag on hobbyists, just something to be conscious of. The classical view of Kazush ultimately vanished because people went into their training asking themselves what the fastest way to a gold medal was. I wonder how things might be different if even 10% more people went into a martial art asking themselves how they can push that art forward. That's all for now. Thanks for watching.